A warm round of applause. Awesome. So hello everybody. Um, as he said, my name is Sedina Molano and I'm an instructional designer at TechChange, which is an online learning company in Washington, DC. I'm also the founder of the Yenara Robotics Program, which is an educational robotics training program in Ghana. And um, fun fact, um, as I was actually putting together the pictures of my teams, I could see that we like uh, to jump, evidently. <laughs> Um, another fun fact, yes, I'm a proud Ghanaian. Is there, is there anyone from Ghana in here? Maybe? Woo, woo. Okay, great. Maybe one person, which is great. That's good. And yeah, so when I was younger, robotics was a mystery to me. I would always think, I don't know if some of you can relate, but I'd always think about scenes from Terminator when I thought about the term robots. And then fast forward to college where I had the opportunity to take uh, an adaptive robotics class as part of my computer science major. And there I was introduced to the world of evolutionary algorithms, introduced to the world of neural networks. And it was a world that left me intellectually curious and awestruck. When I was younger, inequality was also a mystery to me. See, I grew up in Ghana's bustling capital city, Accra, and I could never fully understand why girls my exact age in my grandmother's village in Odobing, an image on the left, lacked access to the same educational resources that I had. So on the right, you can see the school I went to um, in the greater Accra region and the school in Odobing. And then I moved to the United States. I attended Swarthmore College in Pennsylvania, and I could see similar inequality where you had Swarthmore, which was a privileged town, and it was neighbored right next to it. You had Chester, which was a town where you could see urban inequality, racial inequality. And growing up, I began to try and deepen my knowledge about different kinds of global inequalities. And I sought to understand and break down the mysteries that I did not fully understand. And a common thread through my education was it didn't matter what I was studying. It could be international politics, it could be robotics, it could be entrepreneurship. But I'd always think about how I could apply what I was learning to my home country, Ghana. So the opportunity to explore the intersection between robotics and educational inequality came through a program in my school known as the Lang Opportunity Scholarship. And it was a program that was organized by Swarthmore's College, um, the Lang Center for Civic and Social Responsibility. And the way it worked was you had access, they would pick um, people from the sophomore year class every year. So you had a cohort, and then they had access to a $10,000 grant. You had a designated advisor, and then you had networking opportunities to develop a social impact project of your choice. And it was an opportunity for me to design a project for my home country, Ghana, so I jumped at it instantly. I applied, was accepted into the program, and had a cohort. So a dubbing, the village that my grandmother grew up in was the community I instantly decided to work with. It was a community that I felt connected to through my countless visits with my grandma, and also a community that I felt would benefit the most from the support. My initial Lang Opportunity Scholarship proposal was to design an entrepreneurial program for the girls in the community to think about how to start their businesses, grow their businesses. However, in 2015, I conducted a, a community assessment and it brought me to lesson number one. Don't assume, always talk to stakeholders. I went into a project um, in, assuming a solution without first talking to, actively listening to, and working with the stakeholders to identify needs. So it was when I actually did the community assessment that I was able to try and find answers um, to questions. So during our community assessment, we asked 30 students. There were 16 students from the first year class, and then 14, am I doing the math right? Yes, 14 students from the second year class. And we asked them different questions about how they spent their time over holidays, to different problems that they had identified in the community and ways they had thought about solving those problems, to just like some of the classes they took and what they enjoyed about the classes. And 
what we saw was through talking to teachers, talking to local residents, we were gaining deeper insight into how the community functioned. And our findings showed us that students learned in a manner where instead of tapping into their critical thinking skills, analytical skills, they were memorizing academic material and regurgitating that. So there was a rote memorization system um, and a learning technique that was ingrained into the Dubbing Senior High Secondary School. And as a result, you can see that there was a lack of practice and problem solving skills. We talked to more people within the community and it also confirmed some of the things we knew. Our dubbing is a largely patriarchal society as well. And we could see that there was evidence that um, the girls were underrepresented in the science classes in that school as well. It was important to us to ask all these questions because asking the questions meant we could find answers and gain a deeper understanding into the community that we we're going to work with. And that brought me to lesson number two. Questions are good. Ask them. I can't emphasize that enough. And so now we had our answers and we started thinking through what the program would look like. So backed with data from the community assessment, we began doing research into various critical thinking programs that existed. And that's where we came across robotics. And that sparked my interest instantly because it was a hands-on way, practical way of introducing the students to STEM in a way that was fun and memorable, so we thought. And so that semester in college, I did an independent study in my, um, at Swarthmore College. And I had a supervisor, my professor, Lisa Meeting, who was in robotics, who taught robotics. And my topic was robotics as a problem solving tool. So I did a lot of research, um, found answers, and that was a research phase of the program. Then in terms of design, we started thinking out what a potential curriculum would look like. So coordinated with different education departments, talked to local stakeholders in Ghana, and started drafting a curriculum which took us to the development stage where we would iterate, gather feedback, talk to people some more, find answers, go back to um, design what the curriculum would look like. And finally, implementation stage. Started recruiting people who would, be, who would form the team, um, which I was really happy to have, and then also local partnerships in Ghana that we could work with. So our curriculum was designed into two main parts. So there was the building phase, and then there was a programming phase. And we were intentional about recruiting 25 girls to be the first cohort for our pilot program, because it was important to us that in a community where women were not necessarily seen as the drivers or initiators, these girls were going to be the STEM pioneers in their community. And so we did that. In terms of what tools we used, we picked the Lego Mindstorm EB3 robot, robotics kits. And as you can see here, it has various components. So there's a sensor port where you can connect your touch sensor, ultrasonic sensor, color sensors. There's the screen display where you can see the program that's been downloaded and then press the middle button to start the program. And the brick is literally, is like the brain of the robot. So that's where everything that you program goes on in there. On the right is how the robotics kit looks like when you assemble all the various components together. So we had our students work in teams to assemble the various components. And it was interesting to see how, um, how much fun they had even doing that. In terms of the software, we used the EB3 drag and drop software because again, it was something that was visual. So it was something that we found that our students would find easy to use. And it was also something I learned during my independence study. It was a software we came across that various schools were teaching using here. And as you can see, there's the start block, which is always in the beginning of every program. And you can attach various blocks at the bottom to the start block. So you have a series of instructions that you're setting for your robot. Down below, there's like sensors, things that you'll use to help with movement. And this is an example of a sample task. So for example, if you wanted to let your robot move straight, you would attach the move steering block, the different motors you can choose from. So there's a medium motor, large motor. And with this sample task program here, it has a start block in the beginning, and it has the move steering, um, where you can choose the number of rotations, you can set the power, 
and all that will influence how your robot is. So in order to do this, our students had to try and figure out what to do to input like the number of rotations. And we gave them a bunch of fun challenges. So there was one where they had to try and move the robot straight 330 centimeters. There was another where they had to try and let the robot draw the figure eight on the board. And all the while, they were learning the basic, like the basic building blocks of programming. So from if statements to loops, having them draw the figure eight. And these are just images of some of our participants um, during the program. OK, so next, I'd like to introduce you to Ellen. Ellen is, she's a girl on the far right of the, of, of the image. And she was someone who, initially, at the beginning of the program, was very shy, very hesitant to even touch the robotics equipment. And with students like Ellen, it was interesting to see how she changed over time. So I'm going to play a video for Ellen where she was doing the 330 centimeter challenge. Yeah. Just gonna play it one more time. So I mean this is a very short video, but it shows like the joy in her face to even just see the robot move and almost um, reach the goal that she has set for it. And I could relate to it. The number of times when you're programming, you've debugged, you've gone through different sessions and like you're really waiting for it to work, and then it finally, you're getting closer to it. And that's sort of the joy that resonated with her right there. And even seeing that amongst other participants also made me reflect on the value of the robots as not only teaching technical skills, but then also teaching soft skills. Because I saw that over time, our participants were also getting more confident as they worked in teams through paired programming. They were able to collaborate with one another as well. Oh, my bad, sorry. And <laughs> in terms of how we tried to measure the impact, um, we used the test of science-related attitude survey. So again, this is also a survey I came across through my independent study. And how it works is you, it's used widely in science-related studies to measure seven science-related attitude skills. So the skills range from social implications of science to career interests to leisure interests. And it works on a Likert scale. So people are choosing between strongly agree to strongly disagree. And one of the questions, for example, was finding out about new things is unimportant. And we, it was interesting to see the classes of the students um, move from strongly agreeing that finding out, about, finding out about new things is unimportant to disagreeing. So showing that they were more curious about new things, um, which contrasted to how they were initially when they didn't necessarily want to be exposed to new things. So it was refreshing to see this. And it showed us a promise about the pilot program that made me hopeful about the potential of it. And it also brought me to lesson number three, the importance of reflecting and evaluating often. As I reflected more and more on the program, I realized something that I think, that I often haven't necessarily talked about with this program, but that I think is important to highlight here. This isn't only a story about robots or girls or STEM in Ghana. It's about the relationship between technical and soft skills. Because when you think about robots, you are probably thinking of robots as the solution, as the endpoint. You have a problem and you build the machine to solve a problem for you. You end on the technology. But with this program, we flip that relationship. The end was not the tech. The end is the soft skills. It was a critical thinking skills. It was a problem solving skills. And it was using technology to reach a non-technical goal. We used these robots as tools to help solve a problem that was beyond the robotics. And as you go about your work, as you're learning more um, and delving into the computer science applications, I encourage you all to think through how you can apply your computer science work to achieve results beyond the technology itself. Again, my name is Sedina Molanyo, and thank you so much for your time today.